Okay, so what you're telling me is that you knew about the NSYNC reunion for Trolls months before. Oh my God. I can't believe. I, I have never kept a secret for that long, let Girl. me tell you. Hello, I'm Jacqueline Coley and welcome to Scene on the Screen brought to you by Make It Universal and Rotten Tomatoes, where we talk movies with some of the people behind the scenes at NBC Universal. When entertainment works best, sometimes it opens a window into a world we've never imagined. Other times it shows us a mirror image of our lives with a heightened sense of home. Today, we're gonna dig into the question, what have you seen on the screen that has done that? My guest today is Angela Leyes. Angela, welcome to Scene on the Screen. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. Okay, mm -hmm. so first question, ask every single person, first of all, who are you and what do you do at NBC Universal? Well, I'm Angela Leis and I'm Senior Vice President of Film Music at Universal Film Entertainment Group. Okay, so I hear Universal Music. I understand that based on my Spotify playlist, <laughs> what that kind of means. What does that mean in relationship to the film group? Like how do those two things sort of overlap? So basically, I run day to day on all music needs for films that are released by UFAG, Universal Filmed Entertainment Group. And that basically includes everything from, you know, before green light budgeting all the way through to obviously working with the filmmakers and like executing a filmmaker's musical vision for mm. the film. So everything that's needed during production, during post, I help with casting if there's music needs, um, working with you know different groups within the company, marketing, um, home entertainment. On the back end, on some of these franchises, it's things like live entertainment when we have like a touring trolls show or yeah. you know video games, things like that to really help kind of, you know, extend the life of a project. But really, first and foremost, it's about the music. It's about getting the music team together, helping to choose music, bespoke stuff, like everything in between. Okay, so what you're telling me is that you knew about the NSYNC reunion for Trolls months before. Oh my God. I can't I, believe. <laughs> I have never kept a secret for that long, let Girl. me tell you. I remember <laughs> when the manager, I was walking down the street one day and the manager was like, okay, I'm gonna play you the song, but over the phone, cause I can't send it. And they just got out of the studio and he was playing it. And it was just like, okay, now how am I gonna keep my mouth shut for like six months? Girl. It was really crazy. <laughs> the secrets that are inside your mind. I'm gonna, yeah. I'm just like, I would have, I would have yeah. told everyone. It, it was really been tough. All over Reddit within it was a really day. Tough. Yeah, it was really tough. <laughs> no, yeah. this sounds absolutely incredible. And I will say, you sound like you just get to have the coolest job. And before we sort of like dive into some of the things that you've seen on the screen, how did you come to this? I mean, obviously you have a musical background, but it's like you always have to lose that to also be an exec that keeps all these I secrets. Know. <laughs> well, that's the thing. I mean, you know, there are some people that do what I do that don't have a musical background, mm. um, which and it works both ways. Mm. Um, but I do. I grew up playing the piano and the violin, like classically trained. Girl. Um, and, you know, I was doing it my whole life even up into college and I was just like, I don't, I don't really want to be a musician. And at yeah. the time, you know, like I'm in my early 40s. So at the time, music supervision really wasn't something that was at the forefront of, you know, people's awareness. I think yeah. nowadays, like the newer generations, that's something that everybody talks about, soundtracks, composers, you know, music supervision. But back then, it wasn't something, especially growing up in the Bay Area, not being really around entertainment, that was something that I knew. Um, and it kind of just happened that, you know, in high school, I interned at a radio station up in San Francisco. And that was the first time I realized, OK, look, you can work in the music industry and do something besides actually being a musician. So when I went wow. to USC for performance, I did it for a year and I was like, mm, no, I'm not. not that's not yeah. for me. Um, and then I switched over to the music industry major and, you know, I had to do an internship at the time. The internships that I found were, you know, random companies and Miramax films. And I always say that I think that if it was like Warner Brothers Records, you know, like Irving Azoff Management and Miramax, I may not be doing what I do. But mm. because it was such like an obvious, especially Miramax in its heyday, I was like, well, I want to work there. 
Yeah. And so then I started working um, for a music department at an independent studio. And it, it kind of just has happened that I've stayed in the industry in that job ever since. Doing some cool things, I Doing might add. Cool but we'll, we will yeah. we will get to those cool things through uh, the lens of things that you've seen on the screen. I'm going to dive into our popcorn bucket. You've seen episodes now. Like, episodes have, are live, so you I know have, it's coming. Yes, All right, so yeah. you know it's coming here. Ooh, okay. Do you know which one this is? It's the quote one. Okay. So we're going to dive into our first quote here. Um, this one is... I feel so not Korean when I'm with him, but also in some way more Korean. So weird. What's that from? That's Nora, Past Lives. Absolutely. What's interesting about this film, because I actually got to see it after Sundance, but before it sort of hit everyone else, is how resonant I think the film was for people from multicultural backgrounds, whether mm -hmm. that be people from different races, ethnicities, and just how even though this was a very specific story, it was very universal mm -hmm. in that. Is that something mm -hmm. that you felt when you watched it? Yeah, I mean, you know, the the notion of bicultural identity was something, is something that I don't really see a lot, mm -hmm. um, you know, in films, telling that side of, of you know, someone's story. Um, and so for me, being Filipino-American, it's interesting that, you know, my partner is white um, and, but I grew up very much Filipino mm -hmm. um, in the Bay Area. And, you know, my parents speak Tagalog. Um, I, I can kind of speak it. It was it was my first language. And then, you know, as I as I grew up and went to school, like I started like losing it. But when I'm with my family, when I go back to the Philippines, I pick it right up again yeah. with Nora kind of similar you know her partner is white and she is an American she's speaking English and there's that side of her identity and then there's the other side which you know she talks about like when she's with Sung, she went from like not feeling Korean at all to it all comes back yeah. and that part of her identity you know like is is something that like just comes back really easily to her and for me it's the same exact way it's like you know when I'm with my family um, even like when I speak English, I have like a Filipino accent, you know, <laughs> yeah, like yeah, yeah. It's, it's like the way that I say things, the mannerisms. And so it's about like having both sides of that part of your identity still be there. And sometimes you dim one and like one comes up, you know, and and um, it's but still, still part you. of you. Yeah, there's still, still you, you, yeah. you know, I love that. And yeah. I love that, that there's a movie like that that you can see that that really sort of translates that like perfectly without yeah. without having to say it. Right. All right. Next quote. Um, Those of you lucky enough to still have their lives, take them with you. However, leave the limbs you've lost. <laughs> they belong to me now. Good writing. Yeah, really good writing. Kill Bill. Volume I mean, one. Volume yeah. one. Girl. Yeah. On it. Yeah. Yeah. It's so interesting that you mentioned that it has good writing, but what Quentin as a director does is something that you literally live every day, which mm -hmm. is the perfect sort of needle drop I mean, for every single film. Do you have, have you had sort of those moments before you started doing this as a job, like that you look back on and being like, this has got to be one of them, like battle uh, against humanity. Like, yeah, yeah. Like there's so many. You know, that movie is full of them. And what's interesting is that, you know, rarely do filmmakers use existing material yeah. to basically underscore their film, right? Yeah. Like even a score. Um, you know, Rizzo was part of that as a composer, but he uses, Quentin uses so many things like, you know, the Ironside, Quincy Jones score that yeah. he uses as the kind of maniacal like siren, right? Yeah. Or the, you know, Bernard Herman whistle that is happening when Daryl Hannah's character is walking through the hospital um, and battle without humanity, without honorary humanity. I mean, you know, the things that, I mean, you can't really have a trailer yeah. without that song now when it comes to something that's like action based. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and epic. <laughs> and epic. Yeah, yeah, So yeah. the way, you know, Quentin uses needle drops is really interesting, really unique. And it really just shows what, kind of musical knowledge he has because it's yeah. really hard like I said to have something that is existing that is 
kind of like perfectly bespoke for your film. Yeah, like you know? it, it fits in there. For sure. Um, who was doing that quote for that one? Was that? That was the bride. Was that was the bride? the bride. I think it was yeah. the bride. Like yeah. I can't remember remember that one. She's, yeah, kind of like a, kind of an iconic character. Yeah, and that scene particularly too, because, you know, it's at the very end of the movie. It's when all the crazy 88s are, are, are coming at her and she's basically you know, like wreaked havoc. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, you have all those different scenes where it's like he turns off the lights and it's like a blue light behind like the shadow. Mm. I mean, it's really crazy. The choreography, like it really makes the movie like one of my most favorite movies of all time. It's interesting because it's a woman seeking revenge for her life, but also her thought to be unborn lost right, child. Right. Have you watched it since you became a mom? Like, does it hit different? Yes, it totally hits different. And it's really interesting because it obviously humanizes her. Not that you go in thinking like she's a villain, but obviously she's this crazy killing assassin that, you know, you wouldn't necessarily um, be on her side right away. But realizing what the impetus is for her to like, you know, I mean, I guess calling it even. She talks about how, like, you know, calling it even would really be, you know, killing your entire family. Like, yeah. you know, the journey that she goes on is really amazing Ugh. to watch. Yeah. I w yeah. I would just think as a like, again, as a mom, you're like, I will go all bride. Yeah, I will <laughs> cut. I was like, I will cut a B. Like <laughs> <laughs> and I don't think like you can say that intellectually, but maybe like afterwards. There, would, yeah, there's like something vibe. in you that is like you are you turn into mama bear and you were going to protect your, you know, your your own. Yeah. Quentin Tarantino is probably one of the most prolific directors when it comes to marrying music with cinema, to your point, existing music with cinema. How has that sort of informed your work? Because I mean, I don't know if you were were you doing this job already when Kill Bill came out? I was. I was working on the film. I actually still have that script, wow. um, which is like, you know, the two parts in one. And it, it really, I've saved it all these years because he really is one of my favorite filmmakers. But that movie, particularly that soundtrack, and also just his process really, you know, because it's not so unique, it really makes me think about, you know, how do you stay on your toes? How do you basically put like the v best version of music on the screen like you know mm. it's like part of being a music supervisor is to really know all different types of music i mean quentin he obviously knows so much about music and so the techniques that he uses the types of music that he puts in his films the people that he works with like you know like hiring riz as the composer it was really amazing to to work on the movie the soundtrack yeah. I mean, and everything that came along with it. It was such like an iconic piece of like film history and culture. I mean, I mean people still like go to the, you know, go watch it at the Hollywood Cemetery. Yeah. Like they, people will sit down for both of them put together too, I might <laughs> yeah. add, like yeah. one and two. Yeah. All right, let's move into the popcorn bucket for our third quote. You are a child's plaything. <laughs> that is um, Woody from Toy Story. Toy Story, the I'm original. I'm sure he says it also throughout the franchise. Yeah, he Two, screams three, it yeah. a lot. <laughs> you are a toy, which I always, one of the things that is like a huge plot hole for me, he knows that he's a toy, but he still plays dead. I know. Why is I Buzz know. Light, you're not flying around? I'm sorry, Pixar. I've had questions since 1995. Uh, I think everybody, if you work on any animation, you probably have a, a soft spot for Toy Story. But why does that one sit so well in your heart? What I love about being a parent is getting to see the world through my son's eyes. Did he give you reviews on Toy Story? <laughs> no, I mean, he's, he's two. <laughs> Fair. But, you know, it's interesting that just, you know, seeing his eyes light up, like him humming, you know, the music. I don't yeah. know if he was, you know, like was in tune much, but like, you know, <laughs> just, you know, reacting to the music. And then also really, for me particularly, watching him play with his toys and looking at those toys in a different way. Yeah. You know, it's really, again, like those are his friends. Oh, I love that. That's so Two? Already singing along? Girl, I know. I know. a lot. All right. You did amazing. Thank Let's, you. Um, since you've watched before, you know, we're going to go to our next popcorn bucket. You know which one this one is? Mm -hmm. This is the mm -hmm. trivia. Okay. Um, you're going to do great. I promise you okay. that you will do great. I promise. All right. Here we go. Dr. Dre used the proceeds from his album, Compton, which was a companion to the 2015 film Straight Out of Compton, to build a performing arts center in Compton. True or false? 
true? It is true. Dre contributed $10 million to the projects, which would be named the Andre Dr. Dre Young Performing Arts Center, and it's actually part of Compton High School. They actually broke nice. ground on it in 2022, nice. which is crazy, um, especially right now. I feel like West Coast music, especially as a Bay Area person, mm-hmm, you can appreciate mm-hmm. it. It's having a moment. It's mm-hmm. very much having a moment. Mm-hmm. And you were involved in Straight Out of Compton, which was like another one of those moments, too. That was really a passion project of mine, for sure. Wow. I mean, you know, starting from the basic idea that I'm such a fan, yeah. right, and of their career, um, but also, you know, their story being told. Is there anything from the production or what you were working on with Straight Up Compton, since it was such a passion project that you really sort of hold dear now that it's it's been it's been completed? You know, something that is really special to me that I always remember was during our scoring session. And so, you know, um, towards the end of the process, we record the orchestra and, mm-hmm. you know, we have a composer there and it's this amazing kind of pinch yourself moment where you have like a 60 piece orchestra, you have the film playing in the background um, and it's where the culmination of the score happens and yeah. is recorded. Along the process, Tamika, Easy E's widow, she was, she wasn't really on set quite often, right? And um, But she was one of the producers. And I remember at the beginning of the project just being really interested in in her, you know, yeah. in her story. You know, everybody knows Dre. Everybody knows Cube, Easy e But what about Tamika? Yeah. And so I remember Googling her and seeing what she looked like and, you know, obviously watching the film and, you know, seeing her story. And at the stage, I remember looking back back for some reason and I saw this woman at the back of the room just kind of standing there quietly and these are you know closed sessions so I was like who is that woman and then the more I like looked at her I realized it was Tamika yeah. and you know like I said the scoring session is usually towards the end of the film at that point we'd been working on the film for a few years and so you know I don't think anybody knew that it was her oh wow I went back there I introduced myself and then, you know, I, I like to take the filmmakers onto the actual recording stage. You have the control booth and then you have the recording stage, which is where all the, you know, the musicians are sitting. And we were scoring one of the scenes with her and Easy, where Easy is showing her all the invoices and they're talking about Ruthless and how he needs help because it's underwater and you know, we start recording and I kind of looked over at her and just to realize that she was seeing that moment up on screen that was like a part of her life with her late husband being underscored by like these world class musicians. I can't imagine what was going through her head. And I just yeah. thought it was, you know, such an interesting part of her life that I was like Witness intimately yeah, witnessing, yeah. you know, and, and it started with her just kind of showing up and nobody knew that she was going to be there. It's really special to be part of those moments for these people. And especially with music, which everyone has such an emotional attachment to. Right, right, yeah. Going to dive into this one again, true okay. or false. Um, the song Darling Nikki from the 1984 film Purple Rain had to be rewritten to avoid a parental advisory sticker. True or false? True? No. I was going to say, I'm like, I don't know if Prince would rewrite something. No, he but definitely did yeah, not. Yeah, see, I was like, what should I say here? Okay. <laughs> this is what made Tipper Gore go to Congress. Like, this was the oh. song that she heard on her 11-year-old stereo that eventually started the parental advisory label. Like, right. This was the whole sticker. The, Speaking of NWA, right? I mean, really, yeah, though. Yeah. And um, she called it part of the Filthy 15, which is the 15 songs that she and the other women objected to. Twisted Sister, We're Not Gonna Take It, Madonna's Dress You Up, Cindy Lauper's She Bop. Prince and Purple Rain is what gets Dee Snyder in Congress, like right. fighting for rights that you still have to deal with today as far right. as like, has there ever been something where like keeping the song or the moment in there, like maybe up the rating where they were like, no, we gotta get rid of this for MPA or did it even you matter? No, I will say, you know, particularly working on animation, Oh, you got to be careful wow. about that stuff. Okay, yeah. Um, you know, for instance, on The Last Trolls, we had a Lizzo song, uh, Good as Hell. Yeah, yeah. And we were like, can we get away with that? So that's why we mashed it up from Good as Hell into Hello. Oh, wow. You know, like, Look so there's like little, smart. there's little things around it. My other question for you is, what is your favorite song that was particularly made for a movie 
moment. That could be trailer. That could be in the movie. Mm. Doesn't matter. But this was a song that was made for the movie. And what is your favorite one where it wasn't made for the movie and it pairs? And you can't use Kill Bill because we already talked about that one. You know, I mean, the first one that comes to my, look, there's so many, you know, and usually when I'm put on the spot, I'm like, oh my God, which one? For some reason, the first one that comes to mind for me is Moon River. Oh, by, yeah. Um, for, for Breakfast at Tiffany's. That is a great one. Um, you know, that is kind of like, obviously, you can do it so many different ways, right? But the archetypal kind of idea is to have the song, to have the theme interwoven throughout the film, mm -hmm. and it really be part of the movie. And, yeah. you know, it's interesting because I actually don't know if that one, it probably like the theme was written first. Yeah, no, and it then was, the song and then was the written, song was written. Know, yeah, yeah. Um, sometimes it can be the other way around. Like mm. for Trolls 3, Justin wrote Better Place, mm. and then Teddy Shapiro, our composer, took the theme from the movie and interwove it into his score. Wow. So, you know, it can happen lots of different ways. So Moon River was the one that was made for the movie, which yeah. is the one where you like, this wasn't made for it, but it paired perfectly. I got five on it. That's a good one. By the Loonies for us, which was something that obviously existed. And then it was used in the trailer. And I worked on that film. And that was something that, you know, Jordan loved the trailer, the way it was used in the trailer as a remix, super creepy. And then, you know, when we were working on the movie, you know, he had this idea to have Michael Abels, our composer, interpolate it into the score, into yeah. one of like the most pivotal moments in the movie. I dig that. So that wraps up our trivia. You did amazing. Thank you. I don't I don't see why you were in <laughs> nothing to be concerned about. And you've been amazing for this one. And I feel great because I'm about to have the tables turned by an award winning executive, I might mm. add. I this is crazy. I just I, I read about this reading up on you. So you were got honored by Billboard. Is this correct? I did. I did. It was it was a surprise. And I'm very humbled because I'm in really great company. Oh, I love that. So what was the honor for exactly? So every year they do a Women in Music um, Award, and there's different executives, artists, people that are nominated by Billboard um, that basically contribute to music and culture. Oh, yeah. man. And they picked you. Yeah. All right. I'm very scared now to do this then. So what's going to happen now is you're actually going to dive into the world of Universal Pictures and turn the tables on me. Um, this one is multiple choice. So I'm going to hand this over to you if you can pop okay. open that one. We're going to read a quote and then you're going to give me three options. Hopefully I don't embarrass myself. But statistically, these are going to be evil quotes. OK, they will be. What kind of person forgets their 30th birthday? Go ahead. A, lost in translation. B, nocturnal animals. Or C, promising young woman. I think that's lost in translation, right? Is It, it is C, C, promising young woman. Who forgets their 30th <laughs> that's birthday? A, that's a hard one. That's a really, that's a hard one. I would have, I would have picked A as well. <laughs> Move. <laughs> Next. This is unfair. <laughs> Again, hold y'all. Okay. <laughs> I chose this life, and someday it's going to get me killed, but not today. Go ahead. A, Last Night in Soho. B, Atomic Blonde. C, The Dead Don't Die. So my brain tells me that it's Atomic Blonde. Correct. Okay, good. Thank God. <laughs> Thank God. And I think that's James that's McAvoy saying too. that. Thank God. Thank God. Because I'm like, now I'm like, nothing makes sense. So I was, I was about to pick the last night in Soho. We're going on Emerald Fennel. I know. Emerald Fennel kick. Okay. From the moment pictures could move, we had skin in the game. Is that A, get out, B, nope, or C, us? I think that is nope. Yep. Yeah. Yep. I've, I'm like, I, I've, I know Jordan go, Peele. I know Jordan. It's, it's recency. Have I seen <laughs> it in the last five decades before my brain stopped working? Uh, well, I mean, quotes are five, really hard. Sorry, the last five years, not decades. <laughs> not that Okay, old. last one. I don't do high fives. Girl. Which movie does this belong to? A, Trolls. B, Fate of the Furious. C, Pop Star Never Stop Never Stopping. That's hard. I don't do high fives. Fade and the Furious. 
Pops. Trolls. It's trolls? <laughs> no. It's the one that you I just, did not guess. <laughs> I know, but I would have never guessed trolls. Uh, I would have never guessed trolls. I thought that was something like The Rock said yeah. to like Vin and like, no, I don't do high five. I think it's the cl- uh, cloud guy. Yes. And, and Branch was like, all being all Branch. Hey, I did better. This yeah, is the best I've done in like four episodes. I will tell you this right now. Y'all are evil. Ugh. Thank you, though. It's hard. It's um, hard. And if anybody got like in the comments, if you got all of those, come come like you need to interview here because I'm <laughs> telling you, man, that is that is some hardness. But it was great. It was really fun. And that was really fun. Thank you so much for coming in today, telling us about some of the things that you've seen on the screen and for sharing your story, Angela. It was so great to talk. For having me. It was Thanks. awesome.